Oh, yeah, I'm up. Okay, good evening. I'm happy and honored to host uh, tonight's webinar. Okay, my name is Yi Kang. I'm from the School of Media Arts and Design in the field of industrial design. Okay, the title for tonight is Introduction to uh, Industrial Design, Bringing Products from Concept to Reality. 
Um, I guess before I'm going to introduce the speaker tonight, I probably have to introduce quickly what is uh, industrial design. I know many of you out there are unaware of what is industrial design. Uh, well, this includes my family members who might still be wondering what I do for a living in the past 20 years. Okay. Well, the short form for industrial design is ID, uh, but no, no. We are not talking about interior designer here, okay? Uh, well, even though industrial designer do works with interior designer, especially in the furniture design, lighting design, to name a few, but we are not interior designers. And another common mistake is that some people like to link us with industrial engineers. Yeah, but industrial designer is different from industrial engineers. Yeah, we, we can understand a little bit of design for assembly, but we are not industrial engineer. So the question is, what do we do? Okay, I have a fun fact over here. Every human being is exposed to more than 70 products daily. To name a few, my headset, glasses, uh, your handphone, mouse, your car, uh, all the appliances on the kitchen. Um, uh, these are all designed by industrial designers. Okay. Um, the term industrial design, I think it started during the first industrial revolution. Okay, so where are we now? We are at the fourth industrial revolution, right? Okay, so let me bring you back a little bit to the industrial design history. Now, okay, okay, I know, okay, this is a Friday night, even though you are very relaxed, I'm not going to make you go to sleep by telling you uh, the history lesson. Just a little bit. Okay, now, before the industrial revolutions, products um, were made by artisans, individuals. Okay, they are like carpenters, metalsmith, but they are not mass produced. Okay, but with the introduction of steam, uh, steam engine, the machine started to produce products, and this is where the industrial designer was born. Uh, in the very beginning, the industrial designer uh, was created to design for the machine. But that was a long time ago now. Uh, today, we are not only designing for the machines. We are designing for the human. We are creating experiences. Okay? So, until now, um, it's still quite difficult sometimes for me to explain my work. And the other day, I was thinking to myself, how should I call myself, you know, an industrial designer? So, I found this word. I'm kind of like a fixer in a good way, okay? Uh, if you check dictionary fixer, it's kind of like a negative word, but I'm, I'm kind of like a good fixer. Uh, because my work, I always work with, uh, I think, three very important parties. Uh, for example, the human, uh, the end user, or the buyer. Uh, this is one of the parties that I will have to study. Uh, this is an uh, industrial designer trained uh, to do the best. Okay, we have to observe the user, we have to understand the user, what they like, what they dislike, how do they actually use the product. And with that, we carry the information and then we have to go to another department, which is the manufacturing area. Okay, we have to understand how this product is going to be made. What are the material constraints? What are the tooling design constraints? What are the processing uh, constraints? And then we get all this information, and then we still have to work with another uh, person, which is an important part of the business, the marketing side. Okay, so we kind of like the bridge uh, to bring all these three very important elements together. When uh, from there, we create a product. Okay, now before I'm going to bring in uh, the speakers, let's take a look at some of the industrial design work that done by our students, okay? Let's just watch a short clips. All right, thank you very much, fantastic. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me introduce you to our guest speaker tonight. Okay, he is uh, Mr. Ang Ti Chen, uh, the co-founder of Expedio Design. Let's welcome Mr. Ang. 
you how are you man hi ikang hi how are you good 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 are you at your studio right yes i'm still at my studio uh here in malaysia in pj yes okay. uh, and, uh you know um we've got it set up all ready for what we are doing today okay i like your uh, stormtrooper there <laughs> thank you thank you okay so uh, would you like to jump straight into it because i actually saw your uh, saw a sneak peek of your uh, slide presentation i'm kind of like very excited about it would you like to jump straight into it and introduce uh, to us uh, about your work and industrial design no problem thanks for the introduction just now i saw the works of uh, the apu students and uh very proud to say that you know um, some of the works look amazing so you know uh, good job to the students there and thanks for the intro on industrial design i guess all of us have so much um different definition of uh, industrial design and uh, yours is a really good definition of how you know it came from the industrial Re revolution so um i'm just going to jump straight into the slides so that uh, we won't bore everyone with uh, all the fine details so you know looking at the products out here all right in my slide um you know that famous apple iphone that you're using guess what that's designed by a famous industrial designer, probably the most notable or most famous one during this century, which is Jonathan Knife. That Dyson fan that you know um, sells for quite a quite a high high value and high amount uh, right now, that's also done by um, a designer. Uh, in this sense, he didn't really graduate from industrial design, but um, he did studied in design school by Sir James Dyson. And that Nike watch, which probably some of you remember from maybe you know about five ten years ago um full molded rubber body that was designed by an industrial designer famous guy called Carl Liu so these are all world famous industrial designers they are very very notable ones uh but you know I think this one is more common that everyone would know of course I'm coming from Malaysia so I've got to bring it back to where we are here um just to tell you you know the Nando's lighting that you always go and you know you might realize that going to a Nando's you see different lighting that's done by our Malaysian industrial designer, Stephanie Ng, who graduated from Australia. The HP printer that you are using at home, also done by a Malaysian industrial designer, uh, JJ Ismail from Aesthetic. One of another notable one would be the Proton um, car. This one is the Gen 2, um, designed also by a Malaysian designer called Damien Chia. So as you can see, um, Ikang was very right, you know, things that we use every day, things that sometimes we take for granted, all these are done by designers and a lot of them are usually industrial designers. Who we are, uh, we are Expedia Design. We are a um, multidisciplinary team consisting of industrial designers, mechanical engineers, programmers, um, you know, the whole works to make a product start from idea all the way to mass commercialization. And we've worked with various brands from small ones all the way to large multinationals. We have been involved very much with the community, giving education, giving talks, um, even involved a lot with internships, um, you know, um, training students or, um, you know, potential graduates all up to be world class designers. We design a range of products ranging from, you know, small multinational, uh, small um, startup entrepreneurs all the way to multinationals. Um, we have dabbled in consumer electronics, access control, hydroponics, exercise equipment, you know, um, you name it, we've probably um, had some, some touch in quite a lot of you. But that's all an introduction to industrial design. And I think the main reason we are here today is to tell you or to explain to you what industrial design is. The easiest way I think that we'll do that is that we'll bring you through four case studies. And why the case study? This way you can actually see, you know, um, how industrial design process takes place, what takes place in designing a product, what takes place in trying to build that product all the way to something that's real, you know, or something that really can be touched and used by humans. The first case study would be fire trainer. So this actually came from um, I would say, I'll call him a very good entrepreneur. Um, he had an idea. And at that time, a lot of the gym equipment, um, especially the suspended, so his, his main target was the suspended gym equipment. And a lot of these suspension trainers were made out of cloth. They usually actually, um, the cloth actually rubbed against each, 
rubbed against each other and you know it started to fray and you know there's a lot of uh, problems when you use it for maybe a year or so and you know you get cloth that's rubbing and it's friction and it'll break off so he had this idea of putting in a bearing and a pulley wheel make everything smoother and then the other thing with all this um, um suspension training equipment was that you know um it it only is designed or was meant for people who had really good core stability or core strength but it didn't cater for the novice or the one who wanted to go more so he came to us with really a sketch on a paper and and he highlighted i still remember he highlighted on a4 paper a triangle and he showed the three main components of um of exercise which was diet consistency and strength and of course he knew what he wanted to do and when he conveyed it to us he wanted to you know um design a product there was a suspension trainer that could do all this and you know um of course first thing you do as an industrial design you go into sketching um you sketch out thumbnails um, that's a very important or integral part of what we do and then we start thinking more of design language so what's a design language that's a very important part of the process so designing something that's just beautiful is probably easier um, that you know anyone can probably do right now but designing something that's meaningful and has a language and tries to accentuate that language that you are are trying to tell people yeah, that's a different skill altogether so when we design here in Expedo, we always start with a language like what are you trying to tell you know like an iphone you know when people hold it you know what do people feel when they see it so you know this is what you try to do and you know we had this language that we wanted to do which was to take um the famous race car from australia called the atom and where you actually use and um and see the engineering marvel where you actually have structure but you can still see the internal um um the internal mechanical and the all the engines and all the components so we took that whole language and idea and put that into a real design and from sketch we actually move to CAD, which is computer aided design, where we actually model it on a computer and render it. And in this process, we usually, of course, have to give customers, or in that sense, our um, our prospects, a few design line, uh, a few design choices to choose from. You know, um, usually we have about three or five design uh, concepts, and in this case, we narrowed it down to these two. And how you know that comes about is, of course, you know, both of it, as you can see. Um, are very much true to the language of like what we wanted to do, which was an atom car. And that considers, of course, the design has to consider the pulley wheel where the, where the, where the strap sits and you know, um, moves and all the locking mechanisms that the engineering are putting in. And of course, we go more and beyond that, that if you want to do rebranding, um, you can actually change face plates and change color and you know get it rebranded for maybe another or a potential uh, or, or or someone who wanted to put their brand on it but industrial designers don't stop there you know i've talked to you about sketching i've talked to you about computer aided design and trying to do a rendering like that you know when we move into manufacturing it goes more than that and we sometimes find ourselves doing it in things like textile design so how does the strap get sewn on it? You know, um, what sort of textile or what sort of webbing do you use? How thick is this webbing? And all these are considerations of the industrial designers when they start doing this and when they start to move into manufacturing. There's even the use or the user experience. You know, as you can see in this video right here, In this video, you can see that how when someone tries to unlock and releases that latch there, all right, um, they don't actually get to see what happens in that casing because that casing there is actually covered. So it's actually covered and that lock pin is not seen. But you know, how do we do that? We have an aligning line where you know you have to align two lines together. And when you get the two lines aligned together, you drop the pin in and it'll drop exactly right in the middle, sweet spot right in the middle, right there. So these are things that, you know, um, industry designers have to do. And it's not, um, it, it, of course, it takes a whole team with the engineers and everything to make it possible. But all this human factor and human approach all comes under the field of industrial design. When we move into manufacturing, how the stitching splits apart, you know, and how we come to details of stitching. 
are also a consideration of industrial designers. We even go as much as to, you know, what sort of cord or what sort of webbing makes it good or makes it correct so that the pin that drops through doesn't cause fraying. As you can see here, this was one of our earlier prototypes. You know, when the pin kept going through that slot there, it would hit the edge of the webbing. And, you know, that's where the designers come up with ingenious solutions, trying to make something that, you know, um, would solve problems like that. Besides designing a product, everything um, uh, a designer do includes the whole life process. So that includes even the packaging. So we as industrial designers sometimes have to take care of things like packaging, have concept designs for it, even up to a transport box, you know, um, and that's something that gets shipped to consumers and, you know, and that has to be considered as well. So as you can see in these few slides in this one, um, in this first example, the range of um, what an industrial designer do is really quite wide. They do everything, we do everything from um, sketching, computer-aided design drawing, packaging designs, you can see even graphics. Another case study would be going on from Fire Trainer. So Fire Trainer actually evolved and um, the founder actually started doing equip, um, boutique gyms. And again, you think that, oh, okay, it's a gym, you know, it's a construction thing. So why would a designer be involved? But that's where designer have that, that edge. And you know, um, in that sense, that sort of thinking and design thinking to try and recreate things in things that are, to create recreate things that are more functional. At that time, functional training rigs were just a bunch of metal studs or a bunch of metal pillars put together. But you don't consider, um, um, you don't consider things like storage. You don't consider things like where to put your equipment. So that's where we started thinking, you know, what if we could integrate storage into a modular racking system that could fit gym one, gym two, gym three, gym four, any gym. And, you know, when um, our, our customers started to expand the gym, you know, they can just order back the same sort of um, pillars and the same sort of equipment, but in different configurations for different gyms. And that's how Fire Trainer or the Fire Rig was born. And again, you know, we went through concepts. We went through wall hanging ones. But in the end, we found out that the best design or the best approach was one that actually had storage in between and, you know, had that possibility of having storage so that if you are starting a gym now and you need a training rig, you don't actually need to go and buy a dumbbell rack. Your dumbbell rack is actually integrated with your fire training of your or your fire rig in that sense. And this is how industrial designer thinks and try to make, you know, designs and applications much easier, much simpler and much more functional. The second case study that I'd like to bring you through is um, what we call the timer dripper. So this is actually a um, coffee dripper. And the traditional coffee dripper, of course, you know, when you pour, it goes through a small hole and the coffee drips and, you know, there's no, um, there's no adjustment of time. So a prospect came to us and wanted to do um, something where you can actually have a timer. And it's something like that um, as, as, it, as the timer approaches, it actually closes the valve and basically, you know, um, that's it. So for us, when we started to approach this project, this is another different aspect. This is a bit of what we call an art aspect of industrial design. And when we say an art aspect, this targets or we, we wanted to make this thing a bit more sculptural, a bit more like a, um, um, a very minimalist, you know, a, a bit like a, a Japanese uh, sort of design, maybe made out of clay. But of course, we know that it's not going to be made out of clay because, you know, it has to be easily clean. So we decided to make it a plastic, but we wanted sort of that appeal and that sort of outlook. And so again, same thing, we embark on our design processes. And we had a lot of um, different concepts. And as I can show you here, we had concepts that were asymmetrical off center. And in the end, we settled for a concept that was very, very balanced. Um, it had two conical, inverted conical, one on, on, on um, um, uh, mirrored on each other to create this very nice elliptical sort of wave in the middle and if we made it out of plastic we knew that it could be very transparent and that gives a really nice feel to it and we had our timer mechanism at the bottom i won't stress in the slides how much um, you know how much engineering plays a part in all our part of design but i do have to tell you there are a lot of the designs that work out there um, a lot of it 
um, has a very important engineering component. But because today, what I'm trying to introduce you is more to industrial design, I'll leave engineering to another time when, you know, um, when we talk about engineering component and mechanisms. As you can see with the slide, things proceed, you know, so we design, why do we design, you know, things that have um, a, a, a two inverted cones together? That's because of grip, you know, that's human, human factor. You know, we have to consider things like that. And when we take this and, you know, when we take this on and we take this further into the process, we do a lot of things like 3D prints, renders, test pieces. We try them out. We see if it's too big, too fat, too small. And all these uh, roles uh, and responsibilities of an industrial designer. In the end, of course, after all the 3D printing is done, we make a final prototype out of um, different materials. And in this case, it's a, a clear polycarbonate piece, clear, clear polycarbonate piece, and you know, along with a mechanism right at the bottom. So industrial design for me. Um, Expedia has been designed, has been around for 10 years. It has evolved from just aesthetic design to much more than that. Industrial designers nowadays play a role in affecting, for me, impacting the future community, um, people who are in the community. And I would like to touch on these last two projects, which I think is um, it's a very different aspect of industrial design or very tr different aspect of traditional industrial design where it's just about aesthetic. And this, part of the industrial design or this part of the case study shows you what an industrial designer can do to impact community through experiences. This is a project called Footbrill. Um, our customer or you know, um, an agency came to us saying that they wanted to help blind people watch football in that sense through haptic touch technology. They came to us with a sketch like that as you can see what I'm showing here. And um, the idea was, of course, to use something like Braille dots where, you know, the Braille dots would rise and, you know, the, um, the blind person can actually feel the ball movement. It is a really, really solid and good idea. But then, you know, as designers, we have to think what's possible and what's not. A very small dot that has to be moved up and down would require hundreds, thousands of motors, and that would not be possible. So we started thinking, how would it be possible to do something like that? And we started to use um, things that were already available and you know, things that were available in the market and repurpose them for um, this particular use. And that is using what we call a G-code system, or in that sense, machining code that is being used in machining or CNC machining. We translated that to an XY axis and started working on what we call the footbrill. We had concepts again, and this is looking at the ID portion or the aesthetic portion. And why do we start with that always? That actually is the pooling thing, you know, when someone sees something just on their first look, that's the thing that will attract them. But as I say, industry designers are not only concentrating, concentrating on the aesthetic portion. So again, we have three concepts that we show customers, things with, you know, different outlook, a fin-like design, inspired by our national stadium uh, here in Malaysia. A more tech-based one, you know, that looks a bit like a consumer electronic piece today. But of course, the final design that was chosen from, the, from, all, our, from all our discussions and, you know, um, an application is something that looks like our national stadium, has that sort of look and feel and that sort of language where, you know, we try to copy or mimic that fin-like design and that smooth transition of curve on the side and from then on we also have another team or another design team actually working on how do you work and make sure that a blind person can actually put their hands on and actually touch and feel the ball and we started then with a cloth and with a lot of feedback and a lot of discussion with um, some of the blind football players in Malaysia we decided that you know a cloth would be the best choice because we then can sew different material on it we can have lines that can tell marking and so if you can imagine you're blind you don't know where the ball is on the field right and your only or your only way to see is through through touch and that can be done really clearly if we had it on a cloth and then we also have different material on the cloth so that as it entered the penalty area of it or even if when, when it went went into the goal 
you know straight away from your touch that you're actually touching a different type of uh, surface and different type of texture. And this, all this could not have been done without the input and the, you know, that, that sort of design aspect from what the designer can do. The final product was, of course, um, great. You know, we even actually managed to do a film for it. Um, I would play that film and, you know, um, you can take a look at what, uh, what happened or what transpired in the film. So coach, I'm assuming they enjoy watching football also. Oh yes. Yeah. How do they do that? We do take them to the stadiums. Okay. So isn't it so exciting to see a, a person with a disability cheering as a Malaysian with other Malaysians because they have the right to be there. Indonesia yang memang betul-betul orang nak tengok dengan aku. Malaysia eh. Sejarah lah, juga sejarah kan. So, paling legend lah sejarah football Malaysia ni ke kelayakan Olimpik tu. Arbogam, Sanusik, Kadek Ali, Batri, Ibni, Saleh Hassan Zali dan paling tak dapat dilupakan Lira Sabah dan Lira Malaysia, James Wong. In order for Azrael, Azwan and Arif to experience that 1980 historic match, we needed to develop a device that would help them navigate the position of the ball for the entire 90 minutes of game. After months of research and development, we produced the world first prototype. We called it Footbrill. What it is, is actually there's a small uh, mechanical ball that's actually moving, telling you where the ball position is. Are you excited? Oh, yes, I am. I can't wait to try this out with my boys. Yep. Yeah, we should. You know, I am excited. It's been quite a journey, an adventure, bringing this technology to life. Today is the official test run for the foot brain. Jom, kita pergi tengok. Something very interesting hari ini. Being visually impaired, memang ini yang kita nanti nantikan. You know, Cik Anwar? Sabar. Let's go, come on. I get you seated. Pernah dengar tak game tu? Malaysia, Lawan, Korea, Selatan kan? Yeah, yeah. All experience. So, Coach, shall we? Sit down here? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The thing that we saw today is the motion. How uh, our football fans experience the game. Oh, okay. Referee sudah memberikan goal. Oh, Itu lah goal pertama Malaysia. When I started off the first half with them, I think that was an amazing moment in time. You know, blind person getting to actually feel the game in 1980. That is the beauty about the foot brain. It's sync. You know, they, they, they actually they are actually reading. Dengan tenang, lepaskan satu sepakkan lerik ke sebelah kanan Kuala Korea tu dan itulah gol kemenangan Malaysia. They know how the goal was scored instead of James Wong jaring satu di bola. Now that is amazing. I told you they were not even born in 1980. Now they know the technicalities involved in the build up to the second goal. We're talking about a match that happened 39 years. 39 years. So this is not something which is like after this no more share screen. Looking at watching the match, uh, commented the match. I think we all really felt it. This is uh this is a match uh, that we are we all have invested interest in. Namaste James Wong. Really? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. you. Never experienced this in my whole life, and I never dreamt I would experience this. But this is like a real dream 
for life one more good word. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I will ever do this. Big foot brain, they are a Malaysian spectator. They are not a blind spectator. You create something that allows them to be part of that patriotic feeling. Patriotism is their imagination. So as you can see there, um, as a designer, we have a chance to make an impact to people and to community. I think we were very happy and we were very proud of that project and sort of what it can do to you know the blind people um, who have always only listened to um, their EPL or their favorite matches. And now we can actually try and take that to something where they can actually try and watch it through touch and feel. And um, we were very happy that DG gave us that chance and we thank them for giving us that chance and for Mojo Film for making that film. And moving on, I would say the next slide or the last slide would be something similar as I said just now on how design um, actually um, transpired or you know things that can do to impact community. So this is another design project that actually takes that, you know, just not just aesthetic feel, and make it much, much more where it's more experience based. So we had a, a project where Honda wanted to create a shopping cart where they bring all the Honda sensing technology into a shopping cart where actually normal people like me and you can actually push a cart around and understand the key technologies in a real car. And why they do that? They won't let you crash a car at, you know, 80, 80 kmh or they won't let you try a car and you know let you do lane departure warnings because that's just too dangerous but then they had a problem of trying to tell the idea or trying to explain the idea to people and that's where this project came about when they first when they first when when they first came to us they wanted they told us we want to this card and you know um we don't have all the sensors um, we can't take the sensors from the car and put it in a cart. So what can you guys do? So again, you know, besides the aesthetic portion, we had to come up with a lot of engineering, a lot of technology, a lot of sensors. That's why, you know, in Expedio, we have a team that have a very wide, uh, you know, wide experience with different, different things. And designers can't just say like, I'm only good in sketching. You know, I'm only good in this. A designer is someone who's really multidisciplinary. They have to know about technology. And of course we have programmers and we have engineering guys here in office. And that's, that's who we actually bounce ideas off. And that's how the Honda Sensing Trolley came about. You know, we started off or we start off always with sketches, you know, we start off with key or important points like what are you trying to do? You know, the frontal collision, the side collision, you know, the lane departure warnings and things like that. And then we start going into design. And again, like just now, which I showed, you know, we start with 3D modeling. We start with doing this. And then we start going into production. You know, for this, when we go into production, we always look at how is it feasible? How can we do this the best? You know, how can we do this? The, you know, with, with a sturdy frame, you know, so that when people push it around, it won't feel flimsy. And that's why all these are considerations that designers have to take. We've built two cards or two different versions of the card. One that was used for filming and one that was actually used in KL International Motor Show where actually normal or people coming in every day can push it around and actually understand the key technologies. As you can see here with the sketch, you know, this, the sketch is always a very important tool of a designer. It starts off the whole idea. And you know, after this sketch, engineering comes in, programmers come in, put in the sensor, but it all starts from this very, very primitive, or you can say, you know, this most basic form of design. And from a sketch, again, why do we sketch it in this way? You know, we take elements of a Honda car currently, and we try to put those elements into the trolley. You know, we try and put lighting, 
we try and put the lines, we try and put, you know, th that white, black, you know, sort of contrasting things. And we try to put all these and make that trolley look futuristic, but still maintain the identity of Honda. And, you know, throughout that, we also, again, look at human factors, things like how the grip is, you know, you know, where are the sensors? Where is it going to light up when you do a lane departure warning? And that all these were considerations of how, you know, and what we do when we try to build a cart. The final design, as you can see, of course, you know, mimics very much a car. You know, um, we had that front grille, we had that front design, you know, we had all this that, you know, really resemble a Honda car. And this trolley, of course, looks good in CAD, right? Looks good on computer rendering. But then it's now time to build it. And that's where, you know, when we start building it, it's time to work with the engineering, with all the key person that we have in our company to bring this project to life. We even go as far as choosing the emblem and doing the correct placement for the emblem. You know, we decided to move it from, uh, or to, to, to wrap it from a real shopping trolley or shopping cart. The reason for that is because the shopping cart is sturdy, strong. We don't have to redo the frame. But, you know, we, we decided to do that because, you know, this is probably the most economical approach and also the safest approach for people when they use it. Along the way, of course, the designers were involved in how the covers fitted in, how the sensing works and, you know, testing it with, uh, with it um, many times in, in office, in front of um, our prospects, in front of our customers and things like that. And of course, you know, we brought it to KL International, International Motor Show. And I would just like to show you a short video of how people can experience it and how design actually played a part to help people experience um, um, a Honda sensing feature in a shopping cart. Yeah, it's, it makes me feel safe. The vibration is wrong, so it can give me a head up so I know that I'm out of the lane. Uh, it's something very new to, uh, to me and I uh, feel uh, quite good. Bila memandu, kadang-kadang bila ada satu objek kat depan, tiba-tiba emergency brake, luar kawalan kita. Tetapi kereta tu sendiri dah ada sensor dia sendiri, jadi dia selamatlah. So as you, so as you can see with that, um, that's how design play a part in, uh, you know, having that, bringing that experience to people, and you know, and you know, having that ability to feel and to understand technology. You know, that's something that's not so in that sense. That's something that's moving forward, and you know, in 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 what design could be in the future, and it's not just purely aesthetics. So with that, I sort of end um the whole slide or what we have here today, um. I would move into the Q&A session soon, but, you know, I think what, what, what's important today that I would like to say is that, you know, design plays a very important part in all our lives. Um, we sometimes take that for granted. Um, you know, that cup that I keep drinking from today, you know, that's probably designed by a designer. Um, this and IKEA cup, by the way, so, you know, there are a lot of designers in IKEA. So everything in what we use in our lives were designed by a designer, and most of them are actually industrial designers or study that field of design. And I think, I hope that what I've done today is to at least give you an overview of what, you know, industrial design is and what possibilities can an industrial designer bring to human, to community, um, to the world. And thank you. I'll move on to the Q&A session now. Well, 
Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Tichen, for sharing. Thank you. Um, I, I only got this thing to say. You know, it's kind of like I, I want to say thank you to you that you really do justice, okay, out there to uh, explain about uh, the work that I do. Um, when I look at it, right, I mean, I think back about 20 years ago, you know, I used to be, I mean, I, I'm still very prideful about the things I do. You know, I'm, I'm very proud about the things I do because I kind of like uh, say to people, I say, hey, you know, you know, we are kind of like can change culture, you know. You know, if just imagine I, today I design a chair with one stand for you to sit, you know, probably you'll be sitting in a, a chair with a one stand. It's kind of like, of course, you know, I'm not going to design something like that. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes people see us like we are an inventor, but we are not actually an inventor, isn't it? It's because the process that we use to solve problems along the way, we created uh, new products, right? So what, what do you say to that? So I think that's true. So I think what the designer does, I mean, like, as you say just now, um, you know, along the way, right, you know, what, what a designer can do is that, you know, in our lives as designers, and you know, what that, that ability that we have, you know, we tend to create new products and new possibilities. And that's really um, key to what is in, you know, in our studies, or in our practice. And that's basically what we can do. Yeah, I think looking at the scope of uh, things that we do, I, I think it's sometimes not easy to tell people what we do, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, we know what we are actually doing, but we involve a lot of uh, uh, departments. Maybe I can quickly share a, a slide here that I want yeah, to sure. kind of like summarize uh, what I, I just uh, mentioned. Okay. All right. Uh, when I mentioned saying that I'm kind of like a fixer, you see, so these are the the people that we are actually talking to whenever we go into a project. Now, depending on the projects that you are going into, sometimes we only deal with the mechanical people, but sometimes we also have to deal with electrical and electronic engineers. And lately, of late, we deal with a lot of software designers because we are, we are moving from tangible products to intangible. So you can see that uh, in the middle, right, it's actually the uh, end user. And we are kind of like the bridge uh, to these people. And this is where I feel I'm very proud of my work because it kind of like make me know, like, you know, like I know a lot of things, you know, <laughs> because you need to know a lot of things. Okay. Yeah. You have anything to add on to this um, teaching? No, I think I think what you say there is spot on. No, I I, I think um, <laughs> you're right. You know, we are we are like that. And I think you. I mean, I always tell you, you're the legend of industrial design in Malaysia, <laughs> but you always say that you're not. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay, I'm not. I'm 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 doing different things now. I'm transforming students to become a good industrial designer. <laughs> yeah. uh, do we have good. any questions uh, uh, coming in? By the way, yeah. Oh, by the way, Tichen, I also know that you are quite busy during the COVID-19 time. Maybe you can share quickly what do you actually do uh, as an industrial designer during that time? So that's good. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, think, um, I think one of the things that we really did um, during that time is that, you know, for us, um, during the COVID time is probably, I, I mean, you can, you can go to our Facebook page and read about it, but during the COVID time is probably one of the, one of the, one of the um, times that you can really say that, you know, I'm going to use my design skills. I'm going to make something. I'm going to make an impact in the world. And, you know, um, we we actually did some uh, small mini projects because, you know, we were in lockdown here in Malaysia. Um, we are just getting all, you know, starting to come out of lockdown. But, you know, we used that time at home to sort of prototype, um, think of things that would impact people. Um, we created a face shield. Um, um, not created a face shield, but we, um, we decided to do a facial production from our homes and we actually provided that to the frontliners then we did certain prototypes of different different things that we thought were cool and you know that could help the frontliner but um project wise i think um the covid did happen and it had it has it is happening right now but we were lucky enough that we still had projects because you know um i think in design, things will still continue moving. You can't just say that, you know, um, all right, it's a really bad time in the economy right now. I can't just say like, oh no, uh, I'm going to stop all my R&D work. And, you know, by the time when economy picks up, you're way, we are way too far behind. So I think that that's uh, something that's quite fortunate. You know, people are still interested at that time to, um, you know, for to come to us for design services and, you know, to try and um, develop and design new things. 
Okay, um, I think we have a questions coming in. Um, well, okay, Mr. Robert Chua. Uh, the question is, how long do industrial designer usually take to complete a project, uh, like the packing of a box or a building? Do they have a long holiday when they finish a big project or continue to work? That that's a really good one, man. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got. I've got my I've got my team here at Expedio uh, listening on to this, so I, I think they're going to probably kill me. So I'm going to probably take the second part of that pro that that question first. Do they have a long work holiday after they finish a big project? Um, you know what? Um, the truth is, I I, I hope we did. I, I really wish we could, but um, you know, um, sometimes you don't have that flexibility, and projects do come in, and you know things like that. So you know, if there's another project that goes on, you know, we take a shot. You know, we don't have a long holiday. We'll probably just take a day or two break, you know, just recuperate and then, you know, we're at it again. And so back to that first part of the question, how long does it take um, for a project all the way from start to finish? I guess that's that's what the question is is about, right, Ika? Uh, yes. How long do industrial yeah. designers usually take to complete yeah. the projects? Yeah. So I think the, the thing is that um, if you ask me um, realistically, realistically, I would tell you it go anywhere from six months to almost a year and a half to two years. Um, that's what th this sort of timeline is what we're talking about from creating an idea all the way to mass manufacturing. Um, you know, of course, along the way, I always say along the way, you're going to get some prototypes, you're going to get some things to show people, you're going to get some things that you can test out there. But really to mass manufacturing, when you reach production and everything, that's not an easy task that takes a really long time. And, you know, um, it's very common to go about a year to a year and a half. All right. Okay, uh, I myself have a questions to ask you actually. Now, yeah. I kind of like going to uh, split the uh, design process. Okay, now you have ideation part, and then you kind of have design and development, and then you have uh, the prototyping. Okay, so I personally like the idea ideation part. Uh, that's where when you describe that your client came to you with a piece of paper, and then you actually go and talk to them talk to them and then you help your client to change an intangible uh, idea into a tangible side. And that, that is the part that I actually really enjoy doing. So maybe you can share what what is the part that you like uh, doing you know, in this uh, process? I think I think us as designer, I think I, I would echo what you just said. You know, um, we, we really like that problem solving part. I think that's in nature with um, designers and people in our field. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about, you know, Having an idea, so it's it's sometimes it's not just solving an idea or create uh, or, to, or bringing the idea to something tangible. Sometimes it could be just very simple problems, like you know, um, for us, um, the thing that I enjoy most is actually it sounds crazy, but you know, sometimes I do really enjoy the problems that we face all the time. Like, um, you saw the fire rig just now. I can tell you, man, I built four of it, <laughs> four of it, and every single time we hit a problem at the building site. And you know, it, it it's it's weird, but you know, solving it there on site is probably one of the joys that you know um I get. And it's the same with design. So, you know, when we get a problem that we can't solve and just having that ability and you know, just you know, just cracking that problem, you know, that gives me the most joy and that's the part that I enjoy the most. But of course, then that's that real world and that's that real thing where, you know, when it goes to production, you know, you got to do the paperwork. So, you know, that part is, yeah, that part is very important. And, you know, going to production, going to tooling, you know, injection molding and all this, those are all very important parts. But, you know, I really enjoy the problem solving part, just like what you said. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I sometimes I tell my students that I get high from actually solving problem. Uh, probably they will not and, understand. And it, but... Crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I think uh, this is something very important. Uh, you you have to have this uh, lightness or the passion to actually solve a problem, and you kind of like being yeah. drive to it. You know, yeah. This is uh, maybe this is one of the uh, the trait you know that uh, industrial good industrial designer should have, right? Uh, right. Besides, you know, good sketching and things like that. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, all right. Uh, another thing that I want to ask you there is, um, is thinking skill an important thing? Uh, obviously, it's thinking skill, right? Is how how much thinking skill is in more in as an industrial designer compared to the hand skill? Okay. I I think that um, if you to answer that, I think that I would uh, put the thinking skill. It, it is you know critical thinking and you know design thinking and the way that we we shape our thoughts. 
it's very important but unfortunately you know i i mean as i say we've been around for 10 years uh, and i've seen people grow and people you know just designers growing in the company that unfortunately really comes with experience and you know um that sort of time you know that to sharpen that skill of that thinking skill that's really important but you can't just you know say you know you get out of uni and then you have that sort of you know that that sort of that sort of skill to architect a product or you know to think of how a product comes about but the core skills like sketching and all these these are really the core of an industrial designer if you can't i, I won't say okay so i would put it that you don't need to be a great sketcher but i think um this is taught in schools as well you've got to be a good communicator whether that communication comes from speaking that communication comes from sketching it's um it's 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 possible that um you know you can do whatever medium you want but you have to communicate your design because if you can't communicate your design to your team to your customers basically the design is nothing i think i think that's a very interesting question coming from uh who as well i think uh, if you can see um yeah okay there's a question um uh, tj we're going to get at this uh, classic uh, question we discussed about I, I know you like this one yeah. yeah i know you like this one so what is the difference between product design and industrial design okay i'm going to let you, you think that because you, you you gave me that answer that day oh no okay okay now uh strictly speaking okay i see i used to call myself product design because i i create products but lately right i want to call myself an industrial designer because i want to separate myself from the so-called generic uh, product design term that they use outside because in they use product design to describe interface designer as well so if you apply for interface designers you know they are actually looking for product design so you kind of like get a bit confusing you know so i think i want to stick back to uh, industrial design because uh, we are different uh, maybe you can uh, emphasize a little bit you know why are we different from uh, product design no i i think i think you're right i mean like you you're exactly right so product design is more general you know nowadays ux ui ui ux can be considered product design but i think the difference mm -hmm. is industrial designer if you ask me it's the human factor so it's the, the the whole the whole ethnography the whole you know ergonomics and things that's not considered um so much in product design yeah i think the other thing that i want to add on top of the ergonomics is actually aesthetic uh, we are kind of like the one that looks into aesthetic as well and make aesthetic work for the manufacturing you see yep okay okay there's another uh, questions from tech yard co uh, what is your design philosophy that you hold dearest in the industrial design fields till today hmm. so for me i think um the for me in design philosophy wise la, for me i think i think i don't hold so much i think for me personally because um i mean all designers have their own sort of philosophy and ego and you know sort of ways but I think that the design philosophy that I hold dearest to me is that for me, change is always inevitable. So um, I actually change my design philosophies according to time. Um, I'm sure if those who are deep or who have studied industrial design know that, you know, what we learn in design history. So, I mean, we can quote the Bauhaus today. We can quote Art Nouveau today and all these very technical terms. But the truth is, we are in a different century and a different time. So the design philosophies change. I think a lot of people also like to quote um, design philosophies of maybe, let's say, um, Dieter Rams. And, you know, I, for me, I, I respect his philosophies. But for me, I think my design philosophy changes over time. And I don't hold so much to one philosophy um, all this while. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have another question coming in from Kamal Hassan. Is there a line to balance when designing a product between being attractive or to be utili utilitarian? This is quite a tough one. Um, you know, um, I think I think um, for us, like just now, as I as I started, I don't know if I say you know, designers or industrial designers have we have no choice. We have that artistic element in us. So um, there's always that importance of designing a product to be attractive i think that 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 is unavoidable in what we do i can't i can't bring myself no like really i can't bring myself to design something that's ugly so you know attractiveness and that is really really part of it and i think that's about balancing that two elements and how you want to take just you know just want to make something that's you know too crazy too hard to produce and everything and you know um i think these are these are these are something that we as designers will have to balance it really really well but we, for me, I think you can't put more importance on one than the other, but definitely I can't design something that's ugly. 
Okay, uh, so okay, we have another one from Yun Ni. Does industrial design require you to know everything from technology to engineering, etc., in detail? Again, yes and no to a question like that. If you ask me, um, it would be very fortunate if you are in a design company or design studio, something like what we are, where you know we have a mixture of designers and engineers and also programmers and tech guys. So that's where you might not need to know everything, but you can bounce idea with every with everyone, and you know you can you can you can share that sort of knowledge. But the truth is also, I think as designers, if you want to be a really polished designer nowadays. It's um it's also not possible that you just you know say like oh no I'm just um, very good at sketching or very good at pottery I mean that's really good if you are probably in arts and things like that and you know in the artistic sense to be a really good industrial designer I think you have to know a lot about technology you gotta you know you gotta you gotta always be reading up about tech you gotta be always reading up about you know uh sensors you know um you know what's things moving how trends are moving so I think that you know. Um, you probably don't need to know everything if you're in a probably a very good mix of team like what we have here. But um, definitely, it is very, very important skill to have all this knowledge if you can. So you're kind of like saying that we are kind of like a generalist. Yes, you, yes, so in some ways we are. Not, you know? not, the, not the deep uh, learners. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, in some ways we are. Okay. Uh, okay, another one from uh, Takako Shikiya. Has the process of industrial design changed over the time you work? What do you think will be important for industrial design in near future? I think this uh, question is a bit highlighted in my slides just now. So I think the process in industrial design definitely has changed over the years. I think when I first started off about 18 years ago, industrial design, I think we were very much looking at aesthetics and you know um, we were actually looking at much on how good the product looks, um, you know, styling and things like that. But I think that what design or industrial design is moving in the future is very much, um, you know, it's very, very open and it's very, very different. You know, we're looking at human impact. We're looking at, you know, how design brings difference to even, you know, um, I think one popular thing today is design thinking, right? And how design thinking is, you know, bringing changes to businesses. It's not even a product, it's a business, you know. So I think that, you know, um, design in the future will evolve and it will be a very important part, just like the big brands that you see today, whether it be from Facebook, Google, you know. Um, and, you know, we can generalize design in a very big umbrella, but I guess that industry designers in that field would play a very important role in the human factor and the human aspect in, of community. And uh, I think that's, um, that's how I'll answer the question. Okay, uh, kind of I myself have this uh, philosophy of um, every design should be able to sell, you know, so whatever you design, you have to be able to sell it. And, and the process sometimes also depends on the customers. Sometimes yeah. the customer really wants something like that, you know, you have to do something like that. Or sometimes they want it to be to have an environmental um, caringness and things like that. So you have to think about things like that as well. So it kind of like depends on what the customer really looking into it also, right? Okay, yes. uh, sorry, we have another question coming in. Uh, Siu Hon T, uh, sorry if I pronounce your name wrongly. Uh, can you share some of your experience on introducing new or creative idea to commercial world, especially when they are satisfied uh, which current established environment? Hmm. Okay, um, I, I think that, um, I think what you're asking is what if you have a very new or some creative idea that you want to introduce with, people who are very comfortable with what they have. I think that's what um, that's what she means. I think, um, as we all know, like, you know, I, I showed the first slide of, um, of an Apple iPhone. And I think Steve Jobs probably did that, right? You know, we were satisfied with the environment or what we were using, you know, what we thought a handphone could be back then. And, you know, when he introduced that first iPhone to us, you know, many people didn't even know that they need it or they want it. But you know, um, that's that's sort of um, the the power or that 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 power that I have to give respect to Steve Jobs for you know being such a visionary and you know um, for for bringing that product and you know tr totally changing the whole the whole smartphone or in that sense the handphone industry. So yes, you might be faced with some resistance, but I think that um, with good 
foresight, but which does not happen to everybody. Um, I, I mean, it's a skill that is not um, 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 something that's born with if, with everybody. But yes, with good foresight and you know, um, trying to predict what people want, that's that's something that designers can do. All right. Okay. All right. There's another one from Tan Merlin. Uh, if I'm interested in design, but I don't know how much about it, what can I do and where do I start? Any suggestions? You can always look for Ikang and go to APU. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think, um, I think, I think, um, I think the other thing with nowadays is that there are a lot of courses online about design and you know there are a lot of um there are a lot more it, it's very different from last time last time if you had interest in design you probably have to go and find someone to apprentice under someone or something but right now there are a lot of um, really so much content and so much avenue you can you i mean design is wide you can dabble in maybe um woodworking some things to start off with you can dabble in illustration you know and then after that when i guess when you're more fixed and you know you know you really this path is what you choose then you enroll in a university or a course like with apu or anyone you know and you know you start taking that really um really seriously as a as a as a as a choice of what you want to do as your career hmm. okay another one uh, coming from chia shun tik uh, is the life of an industrial designer hard do you need to follow any rules or can you be totally free and creative in industrial design? Wow, wow, wow this is a hard one. You can, how, how, how should I answer this? Uh, <laughs> is, is the life of industrial designer uh, hard? You should ask Ikang, then he'll probably be able to tell you. Uh, if, if you like something, right, there's nothing is hard, you know, for me. I mean, if you like to do right. something, yeah, that's not hard for me at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you need to follow any rules or you can be totally free? Mm, well, there are rules for manufacturing that you need to follow. There are rules for marketing that you need to follow, the packaging that you need to follow. So yeah, I mean, we, we have to follow constraint. But to me, creativity comes from able to navigate all these constraints. That's where I get find very challenging. Give me constraint, you know, I solve the problem for you. <laughs> That's 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 why you are someone who's very experienced, and that 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 answer will be very correct. You know, there are constraints. I I mean, I was about to, I was just about to end that. You know, there are a lot of constraints in design. You're not as free, but I think your answer is great. That you know, you say that's how as a designer for you to be able to maneuver through all these constraints because we 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 have to be true. We have to be realistic. Designing is not just you know I can do whatever I want. You have a lot of manufacturing things, a lot of marketing things to consider, and you know that's how you try to move around. And you know, to try to get that to get to the end point. Yeah. Okay. Another one from Zhu Tan. How can the IT field blend with the design field? Hmm. Uh, when you this, say this IT has, field, hmm. Can yeah, I think IT field. There's a. Uh, I don't know. So it depends on what he means by the IT field. But hmm. I think there are a lot of. I, I mean, if I were to say the IT, I think there are a lot of examples of the IT field blending with the design field nowadays. I think there's, hmm. you know, things like. Um, you know, Internet of Things, you know, things like, you know, how, you know, bringing um, um, very traditional IT products, let's say, you know, um, into cloud and to web, you know, with the app and everything. I think that's uh, that has been very much shown in today. Yeah, I guess when you go into design services, that's where the IT uh, people can actually work together with us. I mean, I'm talking about software designer. I mean, yeah. one of my last job, right, is actually working for a dentist. And the dentist is the one that came up with the idea of how they're going to uh, use the software to actually operate on their patients. So I, I cannot do the software side, but I have, I'm the one who actually have to sit down and understand how do you actually do something? And I'm, I put all these constraints together and I communicate it with the software uh, guy and the software guy will tell me, and say, oh no, you can't do this. You know, you can only do this. Now I have to go back to the dentist and say, you can only do this. Can you change a little bit and things like that? So I guess there's a lot of things that we can do with uh, software designers. Yeah. So Definitely. do come and uh, talk to us. Um, we we don't really know when uh, we, we can only know when we get in there, and then we can uh, see what is actually uh, needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from? Uh, yeah. Okay. One more from Chia Shun Tik. Can you be yourself or are you bound to someone else's idea? Hmm. For me, I think um, I think that um, it's like my team, my designers, I always I always uh, try to mold them in that sense. And I think I've worked with quite I mean like throughout the all my life um, from when I started or you know I worked with a lot of industrial designers and I think that 
I think it's very important for industrial designers to have that character, that ego, um, that part of being yourself. I think that has to be there. If not, if you're just, in that sense, if I were to say, if you're just a follower, that won't make you a good designer. You, you really have to have certain things that you believe in, certain things that you think that, you know, this is the way I want to do it. And that, that part of the ego, I think, is very, very important in a designer. So if you ask me, do you have to be yourself? Yes, I think you do. But are you bounded by someone else's idea? Um, I think that when you come to um, industry and when you come to reality and things like that, unfortunately, you might be because, you know, um, if let's say if you have a prospect and they have a very strong, um, you know, they have a very strong way they feel about a certain idea and, you know, they engage you or they commission you for the work, unfortunately, I, I have to say, you know, they, they might have the right to the, the idea that they're trying to push, even though you might think of it in a different way. But, um, you know, definitely being yourself is so important, being a designer, because you got to have that designer ego. Yeah, and then also industrial designer always work in a team situation and we are not working alone. We are working with different types of uh, professional people together. And at the end of the day, the team objective is the most important thing that we build towards it. And uh, I think a good designer sometimes will have to we have to learn when to actually let go the ego and then accept other people's and uh, still contribute a good idea, you know, build ideas on ideas. Yeah. So that, that is a very important thing when you work in a team situation, you see. Okay. All right. Um, I guess we can uh, accommodate one more. Uh, do we have one more question? Uh, yes. Uh, Ziu Tan. Okay. Are there any example when the technology required by the design is not mature yet? If yes, how to deal with it? For for this uh, for this question, I think that there will always be um, design and ideas that are far beyond reach of what the environment or what today can you know can can bring in terms of technology. And it for me, I think how do you deal with it is about the goal of the design project or the brief of the design project. Um, an example, I mean, like now you know drone delivery. Drone delivery is something that's going to happen maybe not even next three years, if you ask me, maybe five, ten years. But um, that doesn't stop us from trying to get, you know, that technology, starting to get that technology to work today. That doesn't stop us from trying. But I guess the goal would be, you know, even if we got it to work today, maybe the technology is not mature enough and you know, goal now could be slightly different when i say the goal it could be like you know maybe the goal now is to do more test trials r d runs you know the goal now is not to commercialize yet but maybe in the next three years it could be a goal to commercialize and things like that but yeah so for me i think that there are many instances where um, technology is beyond reach but i would actually change that goal you know so if someone came to me and say like i really want to do this i'll tell them you know um you know this the technology does not exist today but you know what if you could you know um change that goal or what you're trying to do all right um i believe that there's still one more question coming in from uh Karamin Zin. in your opinion what is the most difficult part of being an industrial designer most difficult part maybe i'll let you answer that first you can uh, <laughs> tough um i never really look into what is the most difficult part because i take my um job uh, quite seriously and i enjoy it and i'm i'm still having fun doing it <laughs> but i don't really know what is the most difficult part. <laughs> okay maybe there the most difficult there must, some, there must be some very difficult part uh. uh what is the most difficult part i know um i don't have actually i, I cannot think of any do you have any to share i, I think for me i think would be that um it's not so easy seeing our ideas actually materialize. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, or seeing our works materialize um, as much as, you know, I want every single concept or, you know, work that um, comes out of our hand to really hit the market and everything. I think for me, that's probably the hardest part. It's, it's not that the project is not successful. I think that, you know, it's possible that we have done our best to make the project successful, but, I think the for me the 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 thing that is hard is always to see that project you know you know we've completed it but you know maybe 
marketing wise maybe budget wise and everything it doesn't really take off as we want it to be and i think that's probably you know for me that's the hardest part of being an industrial designer hmm yeah, I mean, uh, my my take will be why I say that there's no difficult part because to me everything is the same. Everything you need to you still need to solve problems. You know, whenever you face something, you still have to solve problems. So I don't go and compare which problem is more difficult than the other one. <laughs> it's yeah. all problems. Okay, if you take our industrial designers' job, uh, pro solving problems will be kind of like your core area that you want to uh, go in. You have to like um, solving problems. Okay. All right, uh, we're kind of like going to wrap up now. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. Okay. I really thank learned you. a thank lot you. of things from you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having us. And also thank you for the team that is actually supporting uh, to make this webinar uh, successful. Mr. Edwin, uh, Miss Christine, Mr. Jerry. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your support uh, to make this uh, thing move smoothly. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for everyone for participating as well. Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, amazing, your uh, amazing questions coming in from the audience. All right, all right. Oh, have a good night, Ikang. So I'll see you again. And you know, yes, I, uh, very soon. Again. All right. Yeah, very soon we will uh, catch up. Yeah, have a good night then. Uh, before we actually uh, go away tonight, I'm going to uh, quickly bring your attention to the next up and coming ecosystem. Uh, the web webinar is called the Ecosystem for the Creative Industries. It is this coming uh, Sunday, 4 to 5. So for those of you who wanted to know a little bit more about the creative industry, how all these things actually work together, please do join us uh, this coming Sunday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Okay. so. Uh, looking forward for your registration. Yeah. And uh, that's a wrap from me. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.